Uh, and now, if you would please, everybody get ready for this. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. <laughs> I think I'm funny. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Uh, Matthew 6 and 1. Once you've found the place, or if you're going to follow along on the screen, if you are able, please let us rise for the reading of Scripture. Matthew chapter 6 and 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. The Word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed and holy Lord, in these next few moments, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This, uh, this passage reminds me, by the way, that I forgot to put my money in the collection plate, so I'm just going to, you know, let everybody see me doing this right here. Hey, what a great person I am, right? 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 This morning we're going to continue our sermon series in Matthew by looking at chapter 6 and verses 1 to 4. Here, Jesus gives us a principle at the beginning of the topic and then builds on that principle with an example of how to live it out. Now, the principle is here in Matthew 6 and 1. And Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And it is, I think, telling that Jesus begins this portion of our text with, Beware. The Greek word here used in the New Testament appears 24 times and means to pay attention to, to watch out for, or to give heed to. It's not always a negative word. Its final use in the New Testament, for example, comes at 2 Peter 1 and 19, where Peter exhorts us to pay attention as to a lamp. It says, and here we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But here, in Matthew 6 and 1, Jesus is telling us to pay attention to or be wary of or simply beware of practicing your righteousness to be seen. Why does this passage fall here? Because having just finished his six-part sermon on, you have heard it said, but I say to you, in which Jesus condemns the incorrect teaching of the Pharisees, he now launches into a three-part follow-up. Don't you love sermon series? Boy, I do. He launches into a three-part follow-up, and again, these three pericopes revolve around a, sim a single phrase, and that phrase is, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. In the first group, of the, in, in the first group, the you have heard it said, but I say to you group, Jesus is talking about the public teachings of the Pharisees. And here, at the beginning of chapter 6, with the next three topics, Jesus counterpoints that publicity or that public teaching with private lives on topics of giving, prayer, and fasting. And what he's saying in today's primary text is this. When you do your righteousness... 
When you engage in righteous acts, do not do them to be seen. Especially if you're only dropping four ones in the collection plate. Don't wave them in front of the whole congregation to show how wonderful you are. I'm, I'm, it's a joke. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> they are all about doing your righteousness to be seen by people. Uh, yeah, so, so now, of course, they have their own topics. Uh, uh, they're, they're, we'll be discussing those at length. Each of these three pericopes, I mean, have their own topics. And we'll be discussing each of those at length. But Jesus is here preaching simply this. And this is the overarching narrative for the next three weeks. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Everything else Jesus gives is a sermon illustration to drive that point home. Now, please, does not, please note that this idea of those being sermon illustrations does not make them any less important. We are sustained by every single word that proceeds from the mouth of God, and these are indeed some of those words. So the illustrations Christ uses are important, and over the next few weeks, we'll spend most of our time on those. But we have to recognize the context they are in. They come immediately after six pericopes of Jesus correcting Pharisaic public teaching. Publical. Publical. That's a word. It's not. <clears throat> also, they come after the transitional statement, which Jesus provides at the end of verse 48. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. See, don't... Don't fall into the trap of thinking that verse, uh, chapter 6 and verse 1 has nothing to do with the verse that precedes it immediately in chapter 5 and verse 48. The chapter numbers and indeed the verse numbers are largely arbitrary and were added in the 16th century, I believe. So how do we go about being perfect? Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before others. And we might say, that's an odd place to begin. Why not tell us about repentance or the cross or charity or something more pressing than the way in which we perform our righteousness? Like righteousness itself. But the underlying point here is what's important. The underlying point in this verse is pride. Doing your righteous deeds before others in order to be seen by them is to seek their approval or to show other people how wonderful you are. But wait, didn't we just read Matthew 5 and 16 a couple of weeks or months ago? Matt 5 and 16 says, In the same way, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So how do we let our light shine before others while also not practicing our righteousness before others? Is Jesus, the greatest man who ever lived, contradicting himself in the same sermon? And as always, the key to solving this seeming contradiction, air quotes, is context. Jesus is not telling us in verse 6 not to do good deeds in public. He's speaking of the motives we have, or in, in chapter 6, I'm sorry. He's speaking of the motives we have for doing them. Don't do your good deeds for fame, for example. This is why he says, in order to be seen by them. It's a matter of pride. Seeking fame or validation for doing good deeds rather than doing these good deeds because they are the right thing to do. Now, one last point before we move on. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 15, and in Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, and in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, and again in Matthew 16 and 11, Jesus uses the phrase, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapters, chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8, we read, 
Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the leaven that you may be a new lump and as, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, leaven is a, it's an archaic word for, for yeast. It's that stuff that you put in bread that makes it puff up, right? Paul here uses leaven as an analogy for boasting, for telling people how good you are, for doing your righteous deeds before others, so that others may see just how amazingly wonderful you are. Leaven, yeast, when it puffs up the bread, adds nothing to the bread but air. It makes something look bigger. It makes the bread look bigger while being empty inside. Now, I happen to love the taste of leavened bread. But the taste is different than the function of the bread. The function of the bread is to sustain life. And more bread looks better. But if it's leavened bread, it, it does less because it's filled with nothing. In Exodus chapter 12, where God is telling Moses how to prepare for the Passover, we read in verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove the leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. If anyone eats anything made of leaven from the first day of Passover to the seventh day of Passover, that person is to be exiled from Israel, cut off from their people, cut off from their faith, cut off from the tabernacle, cut off from the law, and cast out into the wilderness. For eating a piece of leavened bread. Who here thinks God is just a little overboard on this one? Right? Why is God so serious about not eating yeast or leaven in the Feast of Passover? In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 we read, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the mountains low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Wow. Isaiah begins this passage condemning some king or other, and then the Holy Spirit jumps in and condemns the king of this world. The prophet tells us that Satan was cast from heaven because he wanted to exalt himself to be like God. That Satan could not accept his position as the greatest of the angels, but that instead he wanted to become God, and that because of this pride, Satan was cast to the earth. It was this boasting, this pride, which caused Satan to be cast from heaven. It was the pride in the heart of Satan which caused all misery, all death, all pain in all creation. So when God tells us not to eat leavened bread during the Passover, what he's really telling us is to avoid the leaven of the Pharisees. As Jesus said, to avoid that pride which destroys here in Matthew 6 and 1, Jesus begins 
or Jesus warns us against that pride. You see, he says, beware of it. Watch out. Be on the lookout. Uh, not a passive, if you happen to notice it kind of thing, but an aggressive and active watching for it. Beware of the pride, not only because pride will cause you to fall, but because it will prevent you from repenting. Pride is deadly. This is why the Bible continually warns against it. Someone who is proud of their sinfulness, someone who is proud of their wicked deeds, feels no need to repent of them. They draw their very identity from their wickedness. And moving on, in Matthew 6 and 2, Jesus says, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. This word, uh, hypocrite, uh, is just a word that we don't translate from the Greek. The Greek word here used in the New Testament is, is hypocrite. And it's properly translated as actor, as one who stands on a stage and pretends to be something they are not. So Jesus is here calling out those who stand in the synagogues and proclaim their own righteousness to others, showing how generous they are by making sure that everyone sees their giving. Again, this is Jesus' sermon illustration on the topic of pride. There was a trend a while back on social media of people who would do something very generous for a homeless person. They would give them a sandwich or a large sum of cash. And then they would film themselves while they were doing it. You'd have the, the phone in your left hand, and holding it up and smiling for the camera, and you got a big wad of cash in your right hand, and you're handing it to this homeless guy you're not even looking at, right? And you're taking the selfie. I saw one of these. The homeless guy in the picture was covering his face. He didn't want to be seen. He was trying to preserve what little dignity he had left. And this YouTube influencer with all this money and this fancy phone and the jewelry and, and the ability to just hand out a wad of hundred dollar bills is smiling for the camera. Many of the comments in those pictures, even from unbelievers, were very negative about it. Why do you need to film yourself doing something good, they would say. You're not doing it to be good. You're not doing it because it is the right thing to do. You're doing it to make yourself look good. You are an actor playing a role on a stage. Or the very definition of a hypocrite. But it doesn't even have to be that blatant. Anytime we brag about our good deeds for the purpose of getting attention from them, we do the same thing. I'm not saying that we should let our chair do our charity work in secret or have everyone close their eyes as the church passes the collection plate, although that could be funny. But there's a real difference between giving to the church and telling people how awesome you are because you give a lot of money to a church. There's a real difference between getting a homeless person on the corner $10 for a meal and announcing to the whole world that you're a great person because you gave a hungry person money for food. Here in this text, Jesus doesn't even consider the possibility that we won't give. He doesn't say if you give, he says when you give. Chapter 6 and 3, but when you give to the needy, you do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. This is a bit of Hebrew hyperbole here, but I love it. It's, it's, uh, of course, one hand doesn't know what the other is, is doing. Your, your, your brain isn't here or here. It, it's here. But Jesus is using this bit of exaggeration to make his point. If you do your giving... 
Right? Do your giving, but don't announce it. Don't make it public. Six and four, so that your giving may be in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And here's that phrase. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. I think we might wonder, we might worry... If we do give to someone in secret that no one will know, that we, we might worry that our giving goes unnoticed and that we'll be unappreciated, that we won't be recognized for the good things that we do. Well, that's what our prideful, sinful inner voice tells us. Already our pride is creeping back in. How will people know I've done something good if I don't take a selfie? Your father who sees in secret, will reward you. No good thing we ever do in his name is lost. As the Master has said in Matthew 10 and 42, whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. God is watching. He is closer than your very breath. He sees everything you do. And he writes your good deeds down on a book in heaven. Nothing escapes his notice. He has promised that he will reward you. Which is the greater reward a few like, likes on Instagram, a couple of upvotes on your YouTube video, or the gratitude of the creator of the universe. It just doesn't compare. Pride is destructive. Pride goes before a fall. Pride will wreck everything that you have tried to do. Pride will destroy you and laugh while it's doing it. And it's insidious. It's so secretive. The serpent, the serpent slithers down out of the tree and says to Eve, You will be like God. You will be like God, knowing good and evil, and all you have to do is take it. It's right there in front of you. Pride is the original lie. Pride is the source, the origin of all sin of all wickedness, of all malice, of all death and pain and destruction. And we hold it in our bosoms like a child. It's tragic. It's... Let us repent. Let us repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Let's bow our hearts.